Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to this CLE program called Settling PAGA and Class Action Cases. This program is presented by the Beverly Hills Bar Association Labor and Employment Section, and it's also co-sponsored by the PI and the litigation sections. My name is Nazgul Hashemi. I'm on the Board of Governors for the Beverly Hills Bar Association, and I am the Chair of the Labor and Employment Section. I am the co-founder of my firm, Legal Access Incorporated, which is coming up on its 10-year anniversary this year. I practice general civil litigation with an emphasis on employment and business cases. Our speaker today is the Honorable Amy D. Hogue, retired judge who is now at Signature Resolution. Judge Hogue, I will turn it over to you to introduce yourself and describe your background. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yes, I just came off of the complex litigation bench in LA Superior Court in July and joined Signature. Um, before uh, coming onto the bench, I was um, head of the intellectual property department at uh, Pillsbury's LA office. Uh, needless to say, I didn't see a lot of intellectual property on the state court. Uh, but on the court, I uh, uh, spent seven years in the complex litigation court, where, of course, we see many very complicated commercial and, and business cases and mass torts. And we have an ongoing calendar of class actions that include PAGAs when the PAGA and class are, are filed together. Uh, so uh, although those cases don't really take the energy or the intellect uh, of the complex judges on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we have all of them because uh, when the court went through a budget crisis, uh, the complex judges volunteered to take all the class actions so we could manage them more closely. But anyway, long story short, each of us has about 300 wage and hour class actions and or PAGAs on our docket. So we see settlements and approvals every week, week in, week out. So shall we begin? Okay, so I put to, we put together uh, program materials that everybody should have received by now. The materials include the three model agreements that Judge Hogue drafted and we will be discussing today, as well as all of the cases that we will be discussing today. And then after the program, you should receive your CLE certificate. And let's go ahead and get started. Judge Hogue, can you please share your PowerPoint? I'm going to try. <laughs> Here we go. All good? All good. Okay. Perfect. Great. So, Ju Judge Hope, as we all know, PAGA is about an employee's ability to act as a proxy for the state. Can you describe what does this mean exactly? What are the standing requirements for a plaintiff? And what are some initial considerations that counsel should keep in mind? Sure. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk, of course, about uh, various recent developments and about strategies and, and uh, ways to minimize costs. But first, a quick review of uh, PAGA itself. You know, the judges do a lot of uh, teaching of one another. And in fact, this PowerPoint is a uh, morphs out of a PowerPoint I used for teaching uh, judges about PAGA and class actions. Uh, and when I was first teaching PAGA, we would say, well, there's no case law in point. Uh, statute doesn't say anything. And we would try to reason by analogy and common sense as to what the law meant. But now, of course, it feels like the anti-slap anti uh, cases. That there seems to be a new PAGA or wage and hour case uh, uh, every week or so coming from the Court of Appeals. So uh, let's just go over the basics real quick. And the basics are that the employee is not, whoops, it's not making an individual uh, case. The employee is a proxy for the LWDA, uh, the government agency that is tasked with enforcing uh, wage and hour laws. And if you read the preamble of the statute, it says, gosh, golly gee, California doesn't have enough uh, resources to have enough personnel to uh, prosecute wage and hour violations. So we're going to empower uh, private citizens to serve on our behalf as PAGA representatives. PAGA stands for Private Attorney General Action, uh, as PAGA representatives. And whatever they recover, uh, the LWDA will take 75% of it, and the aggrieved employees uh, will take the other 25%. 
and the uh, plaintiff's attorneys are entitled to reasonable attorney's fees. Uh, it has a one-year statute of limitations, but that's the basic outline. Uh, it's a little tricky because when you read the labor code, you'll see lots of different kinds of penalties imposed. Um, and this is limited to those civil penalties that were available to the LWDA. So although there are statutory penalties throughout the labor code that one could uh, recover on, uh, it's only those that are available to the LWDA. DA. So you have to look carefully at each labor provision to figure out if these are penalties you can or you cannot get if you're representing the plaintiff. Uh, but you don't get any uh, wages uh, or as damages. This is strictly about penalties. And generally, the penalties are, phrased, are phrased as a flat sum, 100 or 200 per violation, something like that. So the case law says it's just not designed to benefit uh, that party suing, the PAGA representative. It's designed to benefit the general public uh, and California who can't afford to staff up sufficiently. The criteria for standing as a PAGA representative are remarkably simple. Was this person employed? Did this person suffer a violation? Very simple. Nevertheless, lots of litigation figuring out what that means. Um, the other thing to keep in mind about PAGA, and this is arguably an advantage for the defendants, uh, there's no jury trial. So it is a shorter process and it is a bench officer who decides the amount of penalties and under the various labor code provisions, of course, uh, there are lots of uh, penalties that uh, can be reduced in the judge's discretion. So I'm, I'm a little bit ahead of myself here, I think. Let's see. Okay, nope, keep going. All right, uh, next slide. Just, just as by way of a footnote, I almost went to trial on a class action wage an hour case. Uh, they never, ever, ever go to trial. I should probably know, it's very rare. Uh, and so I asked myself, what am I going to tell the jury? What's my jury instruction uh, on this case? And this was the instruction that I came up with. And my uh, successor in the complex court, uh, Judge Riff, faced the same question. And his phraseology turned out to be really quite similar. Uh, but this is important to keep in mind because it's not in Casey. I mean, I really looked at all the federal cases, all the state, I looked everywhere for guidance on what am I gonna to say to the jury? And it's important that we keep in mind that the plaintiff has to prove that all or substantially all of the class members suffered a violation that was caused by some policy or procedure of the employer. Uh, and that's that's a pretty high bar when you, when you think about all or substantially all. Uh, it's not most, it's not some, uh, it's all. Uh, so occasionally we'd see summary judgment motions brought by the plaintiff with declarations of three class representatives and another six employees saying, okay, we win because all these people say they suffered a violation. But the standard is all or substantially all. So they didn't even shift the burden of proof. So there are some recent cases about standing. And then the question in these cases is, um, who's an aggrieved employee. This is my father's joke coming through into the PowerPoint. At one time he managed a steel mill in Western Pennsylvania, which is where I come from. And he loved when people would tour the facility because they would ask how many people work here. And he'd always say, oh, about half of them or most of them. <laughs> All right. Uh, so what if, okay, criteria, employed suffered a violation. Well, what if that violation was, um, barred now by the statute of limitations. It happened so long ago, there's no longer a labor code violation. And the court said, no problem, no problem. The two criteria are met, aggrieved, suffered a violation. It doesn't go away because it's older. Okay, so just to summarize a few of the points Judge Hogue made, we're looking at penalties, not damages in the context of PAGA. There are no jury trials and 
there's a lot of case law on what an aggrieved employee is, although it seems that the definition is pretty simple. Um, so to segue into our next discussion regarding settlement of PAGA actions, can you please explain how an employee settling an individual PAGA claim uh, or an individual claim affects or does not affect the PAGA standing? It doesn't. <laughs> Long story short. So this is another case about standing. Uh, and basically, uh, the plaintiff was sent to arbitration while the trial court stayed the PAGA claim. This is even before Viking uh, River Cruises, which we'll get to. And uh, turned out that the plaintiff settled her individual case. And uh, the defendant said, voila, uh, there's nothing less left to this case. So trial court, you should throw out this pocket case that you've stayed. Um, and the Supreme Court said, nope, uh, just because she settled doesn't kill the claim. She was employed. She suffered a violation. Very simple. So she's aggrieved. Uh, it even survives uh, settlement under uh, this case called Howitson versus Evans Hotel, uh, where, uh, again, not only did she settle, but there was a judgment uh, for plaintiff in her individual capacity. Uh, so again, the defendant said, voila, we win. And uh, the court agreed, trial court agreed, but the DCA reversed and said, no, no, these are not the same thing. That was her individual case. Pog is about remedies for the state. The state's the real party and the public um, are the real party. Uh, in Gavriel Logu, I've been practicing how to say it, I admit, <laughs> versus prime healthcare. Uh, we, we have the plaintiff going to arbitration and the arbitrator finds this plaintiff suffered no violations. Uh, and uh, this was the situation, again, where arbitration is granted on the individual claim while the PAGA remains stayed and, and sits in the trial court. Uh, so the court, uh, trial court confirmed the ARB award uh, and entered a judgment on the PAGA, but the DCA reversed and said, no, these are, these are different claims. These are different claims with different rights. So bottom line is winning an arbitration doesn't necessarily insulate the defendant from the PAGA claim. Uh, and you can be the winner, but you're still litigating is, is, is what we're saying here. So there are some ways to more efficiently work on this. You wanna talk about that, Nasco? Yes. Yeah, so PAGA is sort of notorious for the costs uh, easily skyrocketing. So what are some of, uh, strategies for efficient case management? So in the complex court, of course, um, and, and for that matter, as a mediator arbitrator, uh, the goal is to actively manage things so that uh, the parties don't waste any attorney's fees uh, on things that in the end aren't going to matter. So although the defendants uh, often uh, immediately move to compel arbitration, um, and uh, particularly if it's a bench trial and a PAGA, they want to, and there's a nice class action waiver uh, of uh, standing to be a class rep and therefore consent to arbitration of the class claim. Uh, I've been able to talk uh, the attorneys on both sides into holding off on that while we have a quick one day, maybe two days at the most, uh, early bifurcated bench trial, because under PAGA, it's a bench trial, just to figure out whether or not the court's going to find that the plaintiff actually suffered a violation. And if the parties agree to this, then um, you can put off the Bel Air process, which is the process by which the plaintiff's attorneys obtain uh, contact information and the ability to talk to people who are aggrieved or who are in the class. And you can even bifurcate discovery to the plaintiff only. So that's one way to propose uh, a, a more efficient resolution of the case. Obviously, if the plaintiff proves a violation, 
It's very ripe for settlement at that point. Uh, and if the plaintiff doesn't prove a violation, then uh, there's a problem. Uh, one advantage to this, or, or for that matter, any bench trial on an issue, um, is you, you always get a decision. The problem, of course, with summary judgments, and I know all of you live through all the time, and certainly the judges live through, uh, very, very often denied uh, because the standard is so high. Every inference in favor of the uh, non-moving party, is there evidence now, and will there be evidence by the time of trial? Or often the parties don't really set it up so the court can grant it because they don't articulate which evidence shifts the burden of proof to the other side. So uh, the advantage of a, of a bench trial standard is preponderance of the evidence. And uh, either side can win in, in, in an early bench trial, either on the facts or the law. So uh, again, I think uh, if you can talk the judge into it, uh, probably easier to do in the complex courts, maybe than in the IC courts, but you'll see what judge you have. Uh, that's a way, that's a way to get to the heart of the matter quickly. Um, of course, the early mediation, um, always uh, of value. And um, in my short time at Signature since September, uh, I'm sure I've seen more than a dozen of these, and they were nearly all early mediations. Uh, and of course, at that point, the attorney time is limited and everybody has an incentive to settle before they have to invest big attorney's fees. But uh, it does assume that the plaintiff suffered a violation. Uh, so, for example, I once had a bench trial uh, in a pocket case and, the, and I, unfortunately for the plaintiff's lawyers, the witness, um, was not credible, the, the plaintiff was not credible. He contradicted himself from what he said in deposition. Uh, there were many things he said that, that just weren't credible. So based on the facts, um, I found in favor of the defendant in that case. Uh, and so with an early trial on whether the plaintiff suffered a violation, um, you have that ability on both sides. So, uh, Judge Hope, would you recommend that the uh, mediation happen after the bifurcated trial on standing? Sure. Um, yes. I mean, I think if you can't agree to an early mediation or if one side or the other has qualms about whether they can prove this plaintiff suffered a violation, then go straight to mediation. But if, if the parties think this is a better way to go because they're going to get a, a determination, um, then that's the better. You have, every case, as you know, is, of course, unique on its own facts and, and law and who the judge is and everything else. Uh, but one big problem we have seen are uh, multiple PAGA cases being filed. And a big concern on the court has been that the law has set up a race to the courthouse uh, that favors whoever filed first or perhaps who, who got to judgment first. Uh, so that's that's a big problem that we're seeing. Understood. Uh, so in the last couple of years, we've also seen some case law developments for PAGA settlements in particular. So for example, the slide you have up, the Turrieta case, and then we also have the Uribe and the Moniz cases. Can you please describe those three cases for us? Yes. Uh, so Turrieta said, okay, if there's a settlement and a judgment in one case, in one PAGA case, that extinguishes any parallel cases that might be pending. And let me tell you um, the frustration with this from a, from a judge's point of view. Uh, the frustration is there's a case in Palo Alto and there's a case in San Diego and there's a case in, in my court uh, all against the same defendant for wage and hour violations. Lots of overlap, maybe not identical, but basically the same but different. Uh, and it is the defendant's obligation, but it's the, the rule puts the obligation on both parties but, um, to file notices of related case because the judge can order a global mediation if it knows these other cases are out there 
or the parties can consolidate them or seek to coordinate them or do something so that the lawyers are, are working in tandem rather than in competition with each other. Uh, the Turrieta case said these other plaintiffs can't come into the case that's settled and intervene or object to it um, because they don't have standing um, to do so. Now, other cases disagree. So we have, and that has a review granted, so we're going to wait and see on that. Uh, in Uribe, uh, the court went just the other way. They said a parallel plaintiff can object to a settlement, um, especially if, if it's for violations that weren't even asserted in the other case or in the other uh, PAGA letter sent by the plaintiffs before filing the other case. So this goes the other way. And then Moniz also goes the other, or other way, saying, uh, we think the plaintiff can probably intervene and object in an overlapping case. Now, why is this important? This is important because in class actions, I'm sure as many of you know, we often have objectors, particularly if it's a big settlement. Um, one of the cases I settled on the bench was a $100 million settlement. We had objectors every which way. We had lawyers from all over the state um, claiming fees because they had some piece of it. Uh, and it was, uh, it was thorny and difficult, and it, it took lots of briefing and, and investment by everybody to solve the problem. So if we're going to have those same issues in PAGA cases, uh, I think everybody needs to know that. Uh, if, we, if there are interventions allowed, then certainly the lawyers need to get together and talk to each other and try to avoid conflict and try to avoid cooperation or consolidation or some sort of fee sharing arrangement uh, so that it's it's not a big mess. Unlike the federal courts, the state courts aren't going to say who gets the fees. And the federal courts do things a little differently. Uh, so it's a problem. And Judge Hope, a question has been asked. Have you seen the same law firm filing multiple, multiple PAGA claims against the same employer? Not particularly. I, I know that the employers are often concerned about that. Um, I mean, it is true. Uh, I, I have seen, um, you know, serial lawsuits against the same company. I don't know that it was the same attorneys, but you're absolutely right that a settlement only buys peace until the effective date of the settlement agreement. And if there are subsequent violations, you know, it's a new case. Uh, but to be honest, I didn't see that. I didn't see that I, um, for what it's worth. Okay. And so moving to our next topic, what does it take to get a class or PAGA settlement approved? And what are some of the biggest problems that council face in the approval process? So with 300 class actions, with as many with attendant PAGA claims in each of the complex courts, uh, the volume of motions for preliminary approval, motion for final approval is very large. Every judge is doing three of them a week, uh, which means we have research attorneys working up three of them a week. Uh, and the court's resources only give us two dedicated class actions for these settlements, which means that there's a backlog because the attorneys can only do so much. Uh, so the, the big problem that we've had, and hopefully it's, it's going to be better now, is that the lawyers don't get it right the first time. And so the judges come up on a motion for preliminary approval. Week before the hearing, the research attorney works it up. The research attorney says they didn't give us this declaration, that declaration, and they didn't analyze why this settlement is fair to the class uh, based on what the projected damages would be, the chances of succeeding, the problems with class certification, and so on. So, um, you know, the question in a class action, of course, is whether the settlement is fair, adequate, and reasonable. And the judge is looking to see that the strength of the plaintiff's case is reflected in the amount of the settlement. Uh, if this is a strong case, why is the plaintiff side discounting so heavily 
by accepting this settlement. If this is a small case, why is the plaintiff asking for um, lots of attorney's fees? Um, if it looks like a settlement that is too low, is this a reverse auction? Uh, are, there, are there other parties out there who wouldn't settle for this amount? I mean, maybe nowadays they can intervene, but historically one didn't know. So you're looking at the amount of the settlement, the risk, the expense, the duration of trial, extent of discovery done, experience of the council, um, and, and whether the, the class was largely opting out or, or um, disinterested. There isn't a statutory standard for approving HAGA settlements, uh, oddly enough. So it just says the court, the superior court shall review and approve. That's what the statute says. So for a long time, everybody on the bench was saying, what does that mean? <laughs> What's the standard? What are we looking for? Uh, and uh, luckily, you know, what we could look at was the Qui Tam statute in the government code, which again pulls out the fair, reasonable, and adequate language. Uh, and then, luckily, in a case called Williams versus Superior Court, a Supreme Court case a few years ago, um, the court commented that the question is whether the settlement is fair to those affected. So the people affected, obviously, are the employer, the aggrieved employees, the LWDA, who gets 75% of the settlement, and the plaintiff's attorneys, who are entitled to reasonable attorney's fees. So the courts now are looking at these four factors, and maybe you say, well, this isn't fair to the LWDA. Uh, why, why aren't more of the penalties, uh, why isn't more of the recovery deemed penalties that the LWDA can share rather than a class settlement for which the LWA doesn't receive any remuneration. So those kinds of things. Uh, the biggest problem by far, uh, there are a couple of cases that talk about the analysis you need uh, for an adequate class settlement. Uh, and these are the Dunk and Couillard cases. So we call it the Dunk Couillard analysis. And uh, the problems we see is, is the parties don't really tell us why this is a fair settlement. Why, why is it discounted 90% on this claim? Why is it discounted only 40% on this claim? Uh, they don't give us enough, enough evidence to see, oh yeah, this claim is really strong or well, you know, it's a little iffy. Uh, so we also see superficial analysis and just not enough arithmetic uh, because we're looking at each each claim, what would what would the wages be or the penalty uh, for each member, uh, and what would the you know why is this discounted? How is it discounted? So it should look like this: How many pay periods times how many class members times wage, uh, and then you take a percentage discount to figure out it's a fair settlement. And the discount might be because it doesn't look like the class is certifiable. It might be because it's not manageable. This would take a year to try uh, or not provable uh, or that the defendant's out of money and, and insolvent. So there are other recurring problems too. Uh, as I mentioned before, just, just not giving us everything we need. Uh, problems with the notices, overbroad release, Etc. So I think I'm back to you, Nazgul. Uh, Judge Hogue, you, you, you were describing that the, the settlement needs to be fair and reasonable to those affected. And you also mentioned that those affected includes the employer. Can you describe some considerations in terms of what, it, what is fair and reasonable for the employer? So the I think what I want to talk about actually is what we did to solve this problem with all of these deficiencies. I mean, it's okay. fair for the employer if the employer is, parent, is receiving, let me address your question, is receiving a, a bar, res judicata, or at least collateral estoppel on future claims. It's not fair to the employer if the next day, somebody can sue for the same claim. So what the employer is buying in a settlement is peace 
and uh, basically freedom from wage and hour cases, at least up until the time of the settlement. Uh, and that's what's fair to it. If it's paying money, it should, it, that's what the consideration is. Uh, the um, the problem with all of these the problem with all these problems in approving class actions and the, and the short staff and everything uh, came to a head for me when we were all sent home for uh, COVID, uh, and that was only about three months, I guess, in 2020, March to June. And I, I thought when I went home, okay, this long docket of wage and hour cases, people are waiting too long to get settlement approvals. And then we end up kicking them and they wait even longer because they didn't give us this or the analysis was that. So I thought I'm gonna work up as many of these as I can since I can't do anything else much. Uh, and that way I should get a handle on the docket. So I sat down uh, with uh, many files and started to work them up from scratch rather than relying on the research attorneys, which is what you'd normally do. And, and my husband kept teasing me because he could hear me cursing every time we walked past the room. The problem was that every lawyer in town, defense or plaintiff, had its own, had his or her own pet settlement agreement. And they were all different. And they were all cut and pasted from prior cases. So you would spend hours just trying to find what you need. And finally, you'd find it, and then you'd see because of a cut and paste mistake, it's contradicted somewhere else. So just the, you know, I didn't know if it was treasure hunting or whack-a-mole, some kind of combo, whack-a-mole and treasure, I don't know, but it was maddening. It was frustrating. And I thought, our poor research attorneys, I never realized what they were going through. So uh, after doing quite a number of these, it, it dawned on me, you know, why can't we just have a model agreement or at least the release is always in paragraph six and I can find it. Uh, and we have a model protective order. You know, why not a model settlement agreement? We all have all throughout the state. There are thousands of these cases. So I started writing one uh, myself uh, and it turned out to be quite a project uh, to write uh, a neutral agreement with a neutral class notice attached. Uh, but that's what I did. I set about to write it uh, and I'm sure it was well over 100 hours. Uh, then I argued with my husband about it for some period of months because he had done plaintiff side class action cases at the end of his career. Uh, and then I vetted it with um, the complex judges and our research attorneys and incorporated all of their comments, suggestions, etc. cetera. Um, and I have to tell you, my colleagues looked at me with a kind of uh, you go girl look, you know, like, knock yourself out, uh, because they didn't think the lawyers would go for it. Uh, but I thought the lawyers would go for it, so I, I, I hung in there. Uh, and the first one I wrote was a combo PAGA and class action settlement with a form notice. Uh, later, we called out from that just a pure PAGA and a pure class action. But we didn't um, introduce it to the public just based on what we had done internally. Uh, what we did was we, we formed a committee of eight plaintiff's lawyers and eight defense lawyers who were regular customers on these cases, experts on them, to vet it. And we had uh, Allison Wallen, a very fine attorney, um, heading up the defense side, and Eric Kingsley, who does a lot of these on the plaintiff side, head up the uh, plaintiff side. Um, and uh, to my astonishment, they agreed very quickly. They had a couple of issues that were easily solved. Uh, and so the finalizing of the agreements has their imprimatur on it. We called it an ad hoc committee for wage and hour cases. Uh, so, uh, so you can all be um, assured that these agreements are very neutral, uh, not just because the judges think they are, but because the bar thinks they are. And, and the, the agreements build in a lot of things to help the parties give the court what it needs to be approved the first go round in a motion for preliminary approval of a class action. Uh, so you'll see that uh, it also uh, encourages the parties to quickly file a motion for preliminary approval. Um, and by listing all of these things that have to be in there, 
including a red line version of the model agreement so we can see what was changed very quickly. Uh, it, uh, it should very much uh, grease uh, the approval process in the court. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, it, you will see that the PAGA agreement and the, and the uh, joint PAGA class action does not have a service award for the plaintiff. Um, the, it's not in the um, statute anywhere. Uh, in fact, the statute says the penalties shall be distributed, 75%, 25%. Uh, and the, there's lots of case law saying it's enough incentive for the aggrieved employees to just bring these cases uh, as is. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if the PAGA representative is providing a general release of all claims, meaning not just wage and hour, but maybe discrimination or you name it, um, certainly there can be consideration paid for that. So that's not uh, an incentive award, uh, that's consideration for something else. Uh, so that's the way the agreement is, that's why the agreement's written that way. Uh, okay, I think we're back to you. Okay, so the, the model agreements, they address issues like the inadequate analyses, missing documents, overbroad releases, and problematic notices. Um, and thank you for sharing the story as to how they came about. That's a fantastic story. So <laughs> yeah. you, know, you, know, my, you know, anybody in their right mind would have relaxed and taken some time off. But anyway, <laughs> let's not go there. <laughs> Okay, so let's get into our next topics um, topic. So there's been a lot of buzz and coverage on the SCOTUS Viking River case. And I actually did a webinar last year. It's available on the BHBA On Demand. And I believe it's also available on YouTube. Um, and now we're waiting on the California Supreme Court to issue the Adolf versus Uber decision that will shed light on PAGA following Viking River. Uh, everybody stay tuned because I do intend to do another webinar on that sometime in the summer. Uh, but Judge Ho, can you please discuss Viking River for us? I can, but before I do, I see there's one more slide. Uh, I'm just uh, strongly recommending that everybody use these model agreements and you take them with you to the mediation because uh, certainly I'm mediating that way uh, because if you can agree it in principle at the mediation to the model contract, um, then you're not wordsmithing back and forth. Uh, it saves fees on both sides uh, and it's likely to be approved because the judge has vetted it. Uh, and you're likely to have a much shorter time before you file and therefore time before you're hurt. So I'm sorry, Nazgul, I skipped that. No problem. <laughs> all right, ahead. here's the Viking River Cruises. And I don't know about all of you, but I seem to get a brochure in the mail from them once a week. <laughs> it sort of feels ironic uh, to, to see them, but uh, okay. Well, Pocket made its way all the way to the Supreme Court, go figure. Uh, and the uh, bottom line is, uh, at least uh, as far as the uh, majority is concerned, that to the extent we're forcing employers to uh, uh, forego arbitration of the employee's uh, individual claim, that violates the FAA. Uh, and the FAA, of course, is very strong and, and everything, uh, all presumptions are in favor of arbitration, essentially. Um, the court, you know, I have misinterprets because I think that's what uh, most uh, California practitioners think, misinterpreted the PAGA to say once the motion for uh, to compel arbitration is granted, um, the judge should just dismiss the PAGA claim. Uh, and the reason I think it's a misinterpretation that will be uh, spelled out by the Supreme Court sooner or later is that uh, the state is the real party as to the rest of the PAGA claim. I, I don't see how sending an individual claim to arbitration warrants a dismissal, but time will tell. And, and of course, as you probably know, 
sorry, um, Justice uh, Sotomayor in her uh, dissenting opinion uh, pointed out, look, you know, California law gets to decide uh, whether it's a dismissal or what happens to the state's claim. So um, in, in essence, uh, the majority is going too far by trying to make a ruling on something that, that's not really in their ballpark. Okay, this is the class action and PAGA waiver in the Viking case. And you can see it's quite extensive and clearly identifies PAGA uh, because it says representative or private attorney general action and so on. So I suspect that many employers are revising their arbitration agreements in the wake of Viking to say this or something quite close to it. Uh, but of course, in court, we're still seeing um, pre-Viking arbitration clauses and many of them uh, don't go this far. So it's very much an open question on any given case whether it can be compelled to arbitration. Uh, we do know, thanks to um, Lauren Tukolsky, she's an attorney uh, on the plaintiff side. She's been keeping track of every case decided since Viking, and, and she's compiling uh, what the judges have been doing. Uh, and she says about, she's finding about 10% uh, denied the motions to compel arbitrations, basically because the language of the, of the contract uh, was different. Uh, most granted the motion to compel arbitration, but stayed, meaning retained jurisdiction of the PACA. In other words, they didn't buy the notion that one should dismiss, that court should dismiss. Uh, and there was some uh, minority uh, that did dismiss the PAGA claim, and um, these were mostly federal cases. So that's what's going on in practical terms. Uh, as uh, Nazgul, I think, mentioned, uh, Viking's not going to be the end of the story in California. We have a case called Uber, Adolf versus Uber, um, and it's going to tee up the question for our Supreme Court. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm. uh, and review was granted on the Adolf case, so it's, it's coming up to our Supreme Court. Okay, I think we're back to you, Nesco. Okay, so our final topic for this afternoon, and then I will uh, ask you some questions, Judge Ho. There's been some case law developments in 2022 for rounding, as well as the application of the manageability doctrine in place for class actions to PAGA claims. Can you please discuss those cases for us? I'd be happy to. Uh, and just one more downside of the individual PAGA arbitrations, we may be seeing mass actions. I, I had occasion to mediate and settle, I think it was 15 or 16 uh, arbitrations against the same defendant, um, all involving uh, class actions and PAGA. So I don't know if we're gonna see that as a, as, as a development. But yes, th th this is quite an interesting case because historically the, the courts in California have said rounding's okay, but it's gotta be neutral. Um, and, and of course rounding goes back to technology that is long gone now, long before computers. Uh, and so this court uh, in the Home Depot case, uh, it, it reversed a summary judgment motion, even though the rounding appeared to be neutral because the court essentially said, well, wait, wait a minute. Yeah, it's neutral. Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. If you look at everybody all together over time, it's neutral. But, you know, it's not necessarily neutral as to each employee. So there could, there certainly could be employees who are working and not getting paid for all the time worked. And if we can round precisely now with modern technology, is that really fair? And of course we have other cases uh, that have come down saying that the, you know, the de minimis rule is, doesn't apply in California. Uh, California cares about little things uh, in terms of uh, time worked. 
so this really opens a can of worms, I think. And they do it quite openly. They say, we're not so sure uh, that the Supreme Court in Seize Candy uh, was right when it said neutral rounding's okay. So uh, stay tuned on that one. But I, I think employers who have the ability to be pre totally precise uh, would probably be, be uh, smart to avoid the rounding. Uh, the other case that's very interesting was decided uh, in the trial court by my colleague, Judge uh, Cool. Uh, this was a case where it was a pocket case and it was coming up for trial. And she asked uh, the plaintiff's counsel to provide um, a trial plan so that she could make sure it was manageable. And he provided a trial plan that only covered the plaintiff's side of the case. And of course, you have got the defendant saying these are individualized issues. It was only, you know, if it was meal breaks, it was only this supervisor in this department and other people weren't pressured to work through, you know, all kinds of things. So uh, the, so Judge Kuhl looked at his trial plan and said, you know, thank you very much, but I need a trial plan for the whole trial because I'm trying to figure out if I have, how, how can I try the case? You know, I'm, I'm overseeing uh, hundreds and hundreds of cases. Everybody has uh, uh, access to judgment equally. Uh, if, if this is a, you know, long, long, long trial, uh, I, I can't do it. We, we can't do it. It's not fair to the other um, litigants. Uh, but the plaintiff refused to amend it. He said, oh, I'm, I'm going to stand on the trial plan I gave you. And meanwhile, the parties all agreed that the trial would take something like a year. Uh, so uh, this went up on the court of, uh, to the Court of Appeal. And the question was, did she go too far by dismissing the action at that point based on manageability? Uh, so uh, the Wesson court said, yeah, you know, courts have power to manage their calendar. And, you know, if they have to, they'll, they'll strike claims. Uh, that's uh, coming into question. Uh, maybe that maybe that takes it a little bit too far. Maybe it takes it a little bit too far um, that she dismissed the case outright rather than uh, something uh, less drastic. Uh, but under the facts of the case, I think she didn't really have any choice. Uh, so some other cases in court since then have questioned whether the court can really throw out a case. But I don't think that affects the fundamental premise that manageability is alive and well in PAGA cases, because we see reference to manageability in many, many of the reported cases. So this creates uh, some strategy points for both sides. Uh, you know, I've seen preemptive motions to dismiss for unmanageability, non-manageability. Um, I've seen plaintiffs file early trial plans saying it's absolutely manageable. Here's how we'll do it. Here's how they'll do it. Uh, and again, manageability could be a reason to discount the amount of a settlement if it's going to be a tough question whether the court is able to manage it. So those are the new developments now school in those areas. Got it. And then you and I also discussed uh, before today the uh, Hamilton versus the Walmart case where the Ninth Circuit was looking to see if FRCP 23, which applies to class actions, including manageability, whether that applies to PAGA. And the Ninth Circuit ruled that essentially it doesn't. Uh, so what is what do you think of, you know, that opinion in light of the inherent power of the court to basically manage its cases. Yeah, it, there's a little bit of a conflict now, I agree with you. Um, but uh, again, I think it, it's, it's largely because the rules in federal court are not the same as the rules in state court and the law is not the same, even though it's PAGA in both forums. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the Manageability has got to be a factor, uh, again, because of the right to justice, right to access that all the other litigants have. Uh, and maybe the federal courts can uh, say, no, we'll try, we'll try a case for two years. Uh, 
and uh, the uh, the rest of the litigants be damned. Uh, but I don't think the state courts are going to say that. So I, I think manageability is very important. Uh, and, and really, uh, you ought to know, e even, if, even if it weren't a factor, if you know this is going to be a six-month trial or even a three-month trial, you want to know that going into mediation. I mean, that is a big investment, not just by defense lawyers, but by plaintiff's lawyers, and a, and a good reason to find a way to settle it. Understood. So I have a question here. Somebody asked, there's an example where the plaintiff claims that the defendant's meal period policy was invalid as a matter of law, and this is claimed by a class action. And then the defense files a motion for summary judgment, and the court rules that the policy was valid. And then a PAGA case is filed. So the question is, how could the PAGA case possibly proceed if there's already been a judgment entered confirming no violation occurred? So I'm a little bit hesitate to answer that uh, because it's really asking me to rule on what sounds like a, a pending case. Uh, I think all I can really say is the usual principles of collateral estoppel uh, apply. Those principles apply to all cases. So, it's, you, you know, you have an argument to make there, uh, certainly. Uh, but uh, again, if damages are paid on a class action, meaning wages back to the workers. That's a different remedy than penalties, most of which are going to go to the state. So uh, I, I think theoretically, uh, it could well uh, survive. And, it, and, if, and if, if the first matter settles without some sort of uh, even by the same plaintiff is, is what I'm thinking, because the settlement agreement didn't have all the bells and whistles uh, necessary to uh, give up the right to bring a future PAGA claim. That could happen. Understood. Well, that really brings us back full circle to the beginning of our discussion that PAGA is about penalties, not damages. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. I mean, I think the, um, quite honestly, uh, I think that PAGA is going to be here to stay. Uh, I think that the courts will be able to deal with it uh, more efficiently with these model agreements. I do know that the complex judges from all over the state, they meet every year and they've all, they're all aware of the agreement. And I have uh, heard <laughs> that uh, judges in Orange County are using it and, and some of the other counties. Uh, I don't think you can go wrong uh, using it regardless where your case is. Uh, if you put in a footnote that says, hey, this was uh, you know, written by a judge, approved by LA Superior Court and by an ad hoc committee of plaintiffs and, and defense lawyers, uh, because I think the only concern the uh, a judge in another uh, court would have is, well, I don't know what this is, maybe something LA is doing, you know, they, they're going to be a little bit um, concerned about just saying uh, perfect, uh, although I think it's perfect. <laughs> uh, so uh, anyway, I, I would just encourage practitioners to use it. And, and the reaction we got from the ad hoc committee was, this is great, you know, and the, what I'm hearing with the parties mediating with me now is we're using it, Your Honor. You know, this is so much easier. You know, we used to spend hours negotiating every little word and this and that. So that's what I would say. Anybody else that gave us a question in school? Let's see. Doesn't look like we have any other questions, but if you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share, I'm sure the viewers would love to hear them. I have a final thought to share. Settle your cases, or if not, uh, litigate them. In other words, uh, I do hear from the defense side in these cases that it feels like a shakedown, uh, that uh, it's not fair to the employer, uh, and that sort of thing. But I also see a reluctance to actually uh, try them, or at least they aren't tried. So whether that's a reluctance, I don't know. And it could have just to do with the cost of defense. Uh, but uh, I think that the, the parties uh, should settle them uh, 
uh, mindful that uh, they can go to trial and, and having evaluated, can they win and how much can, is it going to cost? Well, that is a lot of very useful information that you provided to us today. Thank you so much for your time, Judge Hogue, and thank you so much for your insight. Well, and of course, <laughs> thanks for helping me out on this. I really appreciate it. It was fun. Of course, it was a pleasure working with you on this. And thanks. thank you so much to our viewers for tuning in. Everyone, good luck with your cases. Thanks, everybody.